Welcome to Diversity in Focus. I'm your host, Khalil Ahmed. And in Diversity in Focus, we always bring different perspectives, different people of different backgrounds, and unique topics that generally you don't normally see on mainstream TV. Today, speaking of unique people, we have a very, very special guest today. We have Kanix Kanikeswaran, who has taken the chance to fly in all the way from Cincinnati. Of course, we think of him as a local in Twin Cities because he's got a McKnight Residency Fellowship, so he does a lot of work here as well. But he's just an amazing personality that has, he has a degree in engineering from India, from the Indian Institute of Technology, and he works as a, in, in, in Cincinnati in the technology area. But one of his passions is music. And it's just not music of any kind, but music that brings communities together. So his whole approach is about building bridges across diverse cultures and traditions, but cele celebrating the threads of commonality. So he's bringing Western and Indian and classical and Carnatic and mixing all his music. Uh, so welcome to our show, Kanix. Thank you, Khalil. It's we're, a pleasure to be here. Thank very, you very much. Very, very happy that you made the trip all the way to be taped in here. The pleasure is mine. Thank you. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts about the type of music and the type of work you do? Um, um, I uh, have created all kinds of music, uh, but the core of what I do is rooted in the Indian raga tradition. I was trained in uh, Indian classical music when I was there, and Indian music is based on ragas, which uh, raga is a melodic concept that deals with uh, the relationship between notes and also with uh, 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 moods and uh, uh, expression and all that kind of stuff. And it's uniquely Indian. It's not seen in any other part of the world. So it's some, something that was invented in the no, no, so It's something that came into being in India several uh, couple of millennia ago. That's so it's a very old, very ancient tradition, and it's been it's evolved over time. And the raga system that we have now is very sophisticated. Um, but the primary work that I've done over the last few years, um, involving bringing communities together through music, is centers around choral music. So the Indian Indian American choral music is one of the key things that you. That's Talk correct. About. Indian American choral, choral music. Um, the thing is, uh, in India, we don't have the concept of, uh, in traditional Indian music, we don't have the concept of uh, choral music at all or choral arrangements at all. Yeah. It's pretty much uh, Indian music is about individual self expression. There's no concept of arrangements or, or polyphony or, uh, or uh, uh, functional harmony at all. Whereas Western music is uh, rich in these aspects. So I came to this country back in 1984 and I uh, was impressed by the the choral discipline that exists here. So that kind of took you into this new area of research and thought yes. process because you've already trained in the classical I was music. trained in the Indian classical idiom and I picked up a lot of Western classical music theory as well and I uh, 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 was uh, uh, compelled by the desire to create something which would uh, combine both these uh, different aspects of music together. A raga what, based were you, system. what were you thinking when you did this? Um, see, here's a world of ragas that is magical. And here's a world of uh, harmony that's magical. Um, and here's a world of human voices that's magical. What can we do to bring all of these together that would give a different sound, a, a different experience, and also um, um, bring Indian ragas to the fore in a very uh, polyphonic choral setting. So that was what was going on in my mind. In 1994, I created my first uh, musical theater production um, based on about an hour of music that I wrote based on Indian ragas with choral harmony. Then we. I'm Go ahead. Well, that is the very first uh, um, uh, tryst with Indian choral music, so to say. And that's been uh, 18 years now. And now the World Choir Games are coming to Cincinnati. Um, and uh, the World Choir Games are the Olympics of uh, choral music, so to say. And it's, uh, it, it's more than a coincidence that the games are coming to Cincinnati where the whole thing started. It started out there. Uh, well, our work started back in 1994. Western choral singing is hundreds of years old. I mean, this is a culture that sings in choirs. Whereas Indian culture is not a culture that sings in choirs. It's entirely about drug, uh, individual, individual, individual self-expression so and this, improvisation. So this yes. melding of these two approaches mm -hmm. is just, I've listened to some of the compositions that you've created and the pieces. It's just amazing in terms Thank of, you. we will play some of this uh, in, 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 our, in our interview during the in-between as well so the consumers can, or the, the audience can watch it. Sure. And we'll put some clips as well. I'll be glad to share let's it. Play a, let's play a little bit of a piece from Shanti for a little while for the audience to watch so they can get a glimpse of what this, this music does.
So tell us a little bit about Shanti and what your inspiration was for Shanti now. Shanti is an oratorio using Sansk ancient Sanskrit text, which I've said to various ragas um, with choral harmony, with orchestral accompaniment. So it's the first oratorio of its kind in Sanskrit. And um, it's, it's, it's a huge production. I wrote it back in 2003. With, uh, I, got, I got support from the Ohio Arts Council to write this uh, uh, production. And uh, we, I had it performed in 2004 for the first time. We had to expand our Indian community choir to get this performed. So we started, started recruiting people and came to a size of about 80 singers from the Indian American community in Cincinnati, speaking a range of languages, all the way from Malayalam to Assamese. And, so these uh, are some of the native Indian languages languages going back to and how many languages do we have we have officially about 21 plus languages recognized i think that's or something like something like that and uh, many more unofficial dialects and all that and we had about 14, 13 or 14 represented in the choir from that the itself indian. was from the indian commu indian american community so that itself is a huge um, uh, diversity then um, we collaborate i collaborated with a good friend of mine by name dr catherine roma who brought with her the saint john's unitarian church choir and the martin luther king coalition chorale to sing with so, us so where are these churches in the cincinnati they are in, in cincinnati itself okay. the saint john's is in Cincinnati, and Martin, the Martin Luther King Coalition Chorale is a diverse uh, choir that okay. celebrates the legacy of Doc, Dr. King. Okay. And we were, we were uh, so so uh, fortunate to be able to sing together. And I still remember the first, but it, it, it was an engaging experience working with two different skill sets all together because the Indian voices uh, learn music by the year, as you as you know it. We don't yes. have a staff notation at all. So it's not like a written script that it's you're not a written by script. the tune. Yeah, because Indian music, Indian culture has never seen the need for a written script in anything for the matter what do you think that is it's is it's a it's a it's a, it's a it's a culture of listening. Um, a verbal fact, culture and a listening culture. It's a listening culture. In fact, the fundamental um, uh, notes that you listen to in music is what you call the shruti. And the word shruti refers to that which is listened to. That was just heard and listened to. That is just, just listened to. Even the Hindu scriptures re refer to the scriptures as shruti, that which is listened to. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's, it's a cultural thing that music is learned by the ear. And the Western choirs look at the uh, written notation and pick it up. They can sing, sing it instantly because they train it. It. So it was it was quite an interesting experience getting both the groups to work together and sing ragas. So you actually had to learn both these formats. Yes, you had to be grounded thoroughly in both the systems in order to be able to deal with two choirs together. During the very first performance, we had uh, sold out shows at the University of Cincinnati, which prompted us to um, get invited to perform at the Aronoff Center for the Arts, a prestigious auditorium in Cincinnati in 2006, where we got an audience of about 2,600, where we swelled to a size of 100. 50 singers it's with a 30 huge, member orchestra. Huge it's a production. huge, it's a huge production. It's so, not so, small so, by any so means just, at all. I don't know how you did your practice sessions. Oh, those were those were really interesting. We started out small in um, local in small gatherings, and then once the groups got together, we started rehearsing in at either at St. John's Unitarian Church or, or the university or some place like that. And uh, when we took it to other places, like a good friend of mine, Raju, a classmate of mine from IIT, invited me to Allentown, Pennsylvania, to conduct a music workshop. And there, I shared with him the idea of Shanti, and everybody's hand in the audience went up, saying that they wanted to do it there. So, so everybody that has heard or seen or. Something. But I, you know, this is a unique thing too because one of the key things that I'm taking away from it as a person who's not mm -hmm. trained in the musical elements is this whole concept of bringing huge groups of people together with this common knowledge of you know, performing together. Mm -hmm. And these are also people of different skill sets, right? They're Absolutely. not all trained. They, they're not skilled people. And see, that's, a, that's the beauty of uh, Shanti. There's room in there for, um, the, usually the, the highly skilled people lead the rest of the people and mentor them and take them to a different level. So everybody reaches a different level yeah, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of perception, of, uh, of consciousness at the end of this project. You must have seen the warmth that prevailed at the end of every single concert. People hugging each other, people in tears. So it was just amazing. So this whole communal thing regarding bringing people together is really working very well for Shanti. The community thing is central to Shanti. And this this was, Allentown was only the second place, and the third place was Houston, where Jay Kumar, another friend of mine from IIT Madras, invited me to come and do this. And there, they, they, we built a 90-member Indian community choir. We collaborated with the United Nations um, International Choir of about 90 singers again. So we had a 180 singers with like a 35 piece orchestra and about what 60 dancers or something like maybe. And how, how long do these performances go like three hours? Uh, about an hour and a half. Hour and a half. Just about an hour and a half and wow. we had about 2800 people in the audience and this concert actually raised funds for an NGO by name AIM for SEVA, All India Movement, Movement for SEVA 
founded by the sage Dayananda Saraswati in aid of education for underprivileged children. So it's not only achieving a goal here in the United States, it's also giving back to the community that really needs it back home. And yes. So very noble cause. Yes, and it creates cultural awareness at a very powerful level. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm fascinated. And uh, I didn't make it to your performances, but I know I'm going to be in the next one. I'm sure you'll be there. Okay. We'll make sure you're there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to move to, because there's so many things that you're involved in. The other thing that I wanted to talk to you about, this is other flagship production called Chitram. Yes. And explain to me what Chitram means and that concept of what you're trying to do. This is a, kind of a portrait of it's Indian a, culture. It's a portrait of Indian culture. It's a portrait of Indian diversity. You see, what is, what is in there? What's the magic behind India's diversity? It is the philosophy of inclusiveness and uh, acceptance, which is what is at the core of the cultural diversity that's in India. And that's what is portrayed using music and dance and visuals from India um, in, a, in, a, in a production that, again, trans again transcends uh, cultural borders. Um, Chitram is not huge like Shanti, but it's still big. We started out with Chitram back at Wright State University in uh, Dayton. This was in 2005. And the, um, then we went on to perform it in Detroit in 2006. And then I was invited by, um, uh, I got a call out of the blue requesting me to s explore the possibility of doing a production in Tampa with the local community. The key thing about all these productions, Shanti and Chitram, is that it uses the, lo it uses the local cast. So it uses the community... The it's the local community. It's locally produced. So it's not like a traveling... Not at all. I'm the only person that travels. Yeah, and occasionally I'm accompanied by my daughter who comes and supports me in these productions as well. Particularly given the fact that we perform Chitram in many cities now. Tampa, Fort Lauderdale, um, of course Cincinnati, Dayton, and Detroit. And uh, now we're working on a Chitram in um, Toronto as well. But the biggest thing for the audiences here is that we performed Chitram here last year. So let's watch this for a brief moment. So that was amazing to hear, um, you know, Dean Maria's comments regarding how this has impacted. Uh, thank you for doing that that, that program, thank and you. hopefully, like I said, we could look at it next one. The other topic that I want to explore is the World Car Games, mm -hmm. which I guess you were involved in. Yes, I uh, went from the beginning, right? From the, the, uh, well, not from the, it, this is the seventh World Choir Games that's going to happen now. Um, this is called the Olympics of Choral Music. It's a huge gathering. Just imagine a gathering of people from many different countries in the world, all gathering to celebrate uh, peace, peace and music. Mm. So it's, it's a gathering where about 15,000 15, singers attend from around the world. And it's a huge uh, uh, musical event, an attendee event. And how many people? They're all coming to Cincinnati? The, this is the seventh time that it's happening. And it's, uh, it's coming to the United States for the very first time. Very first time. And about 15,000 people are expected to come to Cincinnati next week. Yeah. And uh, two years ago, it happened in China. So myself and my daughter, Vidita, was, were selected as two um, as singers to be part of Sing Cincinnati. A very Sing diverse Cincinnati. Yes, yeah, Sing Cincinnati. This is a ring to the name. We were selected as a part of a di diverse choir to go to China to represent the city um, in the games. So it was. It's an amazing experience. I would never forget it at all. But the key, what delights me about the games com coming to Cincinnati, where I live, is the fact that uh, all uh, the our Indian American choral work started in Cincinnati in 1994. Now we have taken it to many cities. So this is like bringing it home. It's now it's bringing it home, and it's bringing it home in a very powerful way. So the greatest Cincinnati Indian community choir is going to uh, participate in the World Choir Games. It's going to compete and it's going to, also going to do a, uh, a couple of celebratory concerts and all that kind of stuff. I'm so from sure that standpoint, it's very exciting. I'm sure it's going to be fascinating. Um, so, so tell me a little bit about it. I'm thinking about this. You have your other regular job. You're mm -hmm. classically trained. But you really got into this movement. Thank God for that because we love it and we really appreciate the fact that we have somebody like this doing this. Why do you do what you do? Uh, that's a very, um, very good question. 
Um, I enjoy what I'm doing. See, the music is um, the sol. I looks like it seems like I'm always carrying a tune in my head, um, and then I enjoy sharing what I know about music. I enjoy seeing the glow on people's faces when they get a concept. Um, uh, I enjoy explaining things to people. I enjoy sh sharing musical ideas and enjoy hearing the collective sound that comes together when a group of people collaborate, collaborate together. And I always enjoy the aha moments when things click when working with a large group of people. Plus, it's I, I get something out of working with a large group of people on a vision that we all align towards. And, and then it all uh, comes together and people see it, everybody gets it. Yeah, that's something very special. You just really cannot describe it in words at all. So, so, so the, only, is, uh, the only thing I can come close to saying is that if I remember, remember all the hugging and the, um, uh, that happened after Shanti, that's a moment worth anything. That's, that's worth it. So this is what in musical traditions we call the pure harmony, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Not to pun on it, but that's what it's, it's, really, that's how you feel the it's resonance. It's cosmic harmony also. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cosmic harmony as well. Um, I want to explore a little bit about your, I know you're a big fan of uh, Muthaswami Dikshadar. Yes. Right? The composer, the famous composer. Mm -hmm. Maybe you may not know. Maybe you can just tell us a little bit about, uh, I'm familiar with Muthaswami Dik. Many of our audience may not be. Why don't you introduce us to that and what you do with Sure. Some of the compositions. See, um, as, as I said before, Indian music is largely based on ragas. And Indian music is about individual self-expression. But there are composers that have come over, the, over a period of time that have dealt with ragas and created masterpieces in particular ragas that we still hold in very high regard today. And these masterpieces are the centerpieces of many of the concerts that are delivered today. One such composer is Muthaswami Dikshitar, who lived between 1775 and 1835. And um, he has composed masterpieces in several ragas, and uh, there's a tremendous amount of diversity in his music. But what I like about his music is that it makes a statement that Indian music is not only about ragas. It's something even, it can go even beyond that. Transcends that. It, it can even transcend that. So the thing is, um, he was open-minded. An orthodox composer like him, like him was open-minded to listen to colonial tunes that came with the British East India Company. I mean, this is mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. um, when the East India Company, came, when the British came to India 200 years ago, a lot of uh, colonial tunes came with them, along, along with their marching bands, particularly at Fort St. George, which Dikshitar visited. And this was in back in India, in the Fort, Fort St. George in India. In India, back in the 1790s. Uh, that's when Dikshita got exposed to this music. And what he, what he did later on in his life was that he wrote lyrics in Sanskrit, liturgical Hindu lyrics in Sanskrit, to these composite, to, to these tunes that he heard. He didn't change the tunes in any particular way, but he wrote Sanskrit lyrics following the grammar of Sanskrit rhyme and rhythm um, and created a set of 39 compositions which are neither completely Indian nor completely Western. So it is like a brand new era of thinking. Yeah, it's, it's a brand new genre altogether. This is, um, you can't call it fusion because it's not fusion. It's like exploring, it's, it's like just exploring another genre in your own terms in a very powerful way. And an orthodox composer such as Dikshita did it. So he is one of my greatest sources of inspiration. Uh, what I did was I got deeper and deeper into this topic, tried to find the source of the original tunes to which he wrote the Sanskrit lyrics. Um, I presented a few research papers on it. I've also traveled to many places talking about this because people enjoy conversations about this about topic. This. Yeah. Yes, because it's totally new and it's an eye-opener for many, 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 many people. We will make sure that we put a link. Maybe you'll give us a link that we can probably Absolutely. put down in our website regarding Absolutely. this. I'm Absolutely. sure there's people that are wanting to explore, especially the people that are trying to understand the different styles of music. and. Yes, and it's a powerful teaching tool for children. Uh, what I did was I had uh, all the 39 compositions recorded in my my daughter's voice when she was 12. So there's a playful quality about these tunes. The tunes are just magical, and the words, once you get to, children get um, uh, hooked onto these tunes, and within a few months of listening to them, they're able to uh, sing these tunes in Sanskrit, just the way they are sung yes. in, the, in the CD. Um, and um, so I've talked about it in many places, like Singapore, and Trinidad, and, and Canada, and so, so many different places. And um, I hope I'm able to take this music and the vision that it, uh, the vision behind it to Next uh, level to a wider com a community to, and to, to the next level, definitely, and to Absolutely. the next level. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, we, we'd be fascinated to help you in any way we can with that. We'll definitely put a link to this, because this this whole um, 
thinking concept of collaboration but bring a new genre mm-hmm. is something that many people don't understand as to you know we used to think of us as an insular society in india and yeah. in east indian growing up but this was you're talking about the 1700s right 1700s and this is in a, innovation at its best and in fact my work on on this has been quoted in international seminars on uh, innovation as well absolutely why not right this is this is a classic example and we are all about innovation talk in the business world yes <laughs> yes my other day job that i do okay um, i want to talk a little bit about your collaborations you've done quite a bit of work just as mm-hmm. uh, you're talking about with people in different communities you've done collaborations so let's talk very briefly about that i've um, I sp- uh, collaborated with malika sarabhai yeah. back in the 19 back in the 1990s in the cincinnati Sym- symphony orchestra play my work yeah um called the snake concerto hmm. and then uh, also uh, i recently i collaborated with lakshmi shankar on, she sang f- as a soloist in shanti it was a huge honor for us yeah. and recently i had the honor of collaborating with gundecha brothers who are the renowned uh, Thrupad exponents back in India. Yeah. See, I have done research on the similarity between the south, the compositions of Dikshitar, who spent five years in the northern city of Banaras, the similarity between his compositions and compositions that are used in the ancient Thrupad Hindustani uh, style of music. So both styles of. Both style, yeah, the thing is, the, the Hindustani and Carnatic. I have a lot of stylistic differences the compos the repertoire is different the audiences are different um and the organizers are different so they like watertight compartments but once you get into the structural similarities you see what is common um and we had this performance with this magnificent performance in Houston just last month when the gundecha brothers sang the compositions of uh, dikshitar and we had been working on this over a six month six month more, more than a six month period yeah. and it was absolutely magical and uh, I'm sure it was a very joyful experience for you because you seem to be one who loves to uh, collaborate a lot as well. Yes. There's a lot of stuff to talk to to cover, but I wanted to talk about a couple of quick things very quickly because we're coming as coming to the close of the interview. You um how are you sharing this information because part of the deal is you know this is a very deep topic mm-hmm. and yes. we're trying to bring it down to a level that we all <laughs> common and understandable. I'm enjoying it for sure. Um one of the things what what sources do you use can you quickly address sure, what sources I, that you yeah i have a website called indian templenet.com where i publish my research on the temples of india i've been teaching music in the cap- capacity of an adjunct faculty at the college conservatory of music university of cincinnati since 1994 where i teach uh, a graduate level sequence in indian classical music uh, plus i've also been presenting my scholarly work at uh, conferences around the world that's that we'll we'll put some of these links out there for the sure. for the audience a lot of lecture it. demonstrations and and uh, sharing sessions for the communities and corporations as well yeah tell me very very briefly about the work that you've done with in singapore that you talked about uh, some of the stuff and yeah i was invited to to singapore to produce the opening event for the international water policy dialogue held in conjunction with uh, the international water week this was attended by policy makers and corporations and others mm. um so i took upon the uh, challenge of presenting an ancient theme in a very modern um collaborative context so i picked the indian raga malhar miya malhar and uh, uh, had my my concerto called the malhar concerto in a symphonic setting played by the students of the by by the uh, the nus symphony orchestra national university of Sing- singapore symphony orchestra so That's we had uh, an indian raga in a western setting played by um chinese artists in singapore at the opening of a global topic which is what is sharing for the next generation let's let's close this one with this little clip that we'll watch about the malhar concerto let's listen and watch Absolutely fascinating. 
Thank you. It, uh, that that uh, you know the composition was just captivating. Um, Thank you. So I hope the audience enjoyed it as well. As I try to wrap up the session today, and maybe we'll have another get together one day where we can talk a little bit more on sure. this one. Tell me about what the future holds. What are your plans for the future? Yeah, um, that's a good one. Um, so I wanted to take Indian raga-based choral music to the next level. I would, would like to mentor and nurture and incubate more Indian, American, and uh, choirs throughout uh, here. And you have and a daughter who's getting in to teach that as well. Yes, she's beginning to help teach and conduct as well. I'd like to expand the repertoire of raga-based uh, uh, choral music, write more, and publish my research in the form of books. And I'd like to take Shanti to more communities. And the one of the dreams that I have is to have a Shanti reunion where, where we invite Shanti alumni singers and uh, get to perform Shanti on a large scale, with hopefully with the Boston Philharmonic at the Kennedy Center. Oh, that is such a good dream, and I think I wish you the best with all the stuff. We, I've actually enjoyed uh, our conversation and and actually watching all the work. Uh, hopefully, the audience will also. We'll, we've only been able to give snippets of this into this thing, but thank you for being uh, in our as a guest. And to the audience from uh, Diversity in Focus, I want to say thank you for watching uh, Diversity in Focus. We'll be bringing more interviews like this and more exciting topics for you in the future as well. Uh, thank you for watching. And till another program, this is Khalil Ahmed, your host, signing off. Uh, for today.